А, така, текущата лекция е на Николай Стоицов. Съжалявам, забравям много имена. А, Николай е бекенд инженер а, в Uber и днес ще ни говори по името на лекцията как са си сътворили някои красиви неща отзад. Аплодисменти. Hello everybody. This, it was previously announced this talk is going to be in English because we have some foreign visitors. So uh, let's get started. First, I want to ask you how many of you know what microservices are? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have done microservices in production? Okay, good, nice. So let's, let's discuss it. How to build a nice microservice architecture with open technologies? So, as you heard, I'm a software engineer at Uber. Uh, when I work on the backend systems that are responsible for uh, all aspects of uh, the money movement in Uber, and uh, everything that we do is uh, scalable, it's a microservice architecture with uh, thousands of services, and uh, we work on it every day. So, but before we talk about microservices, I want, I want to discourage you to use them, uh, because there is a lot of overhead. Uh, we're going to see later that you need a lot of tools to orchestrate them properly, to uh, deploy them properly, in order for them to communicate properly with uh, the services with each other. Um, initially, it's pretty good if you um, start with a single application. Actually, this is how Uber started. We started with one application, then we split, split it in three applications, and then we split each of these more. And this is how we came up with, came up with our architecture. And initially, you need to have a pretty good API. And if you want to start doing microservices to split that API in um, services, you need to have really great, good defined components. What, what do I mean by component? A component in a software architecture is a piece that uh, can be upgraded and deployed separately. So basically, if you have this app application that you can't just upgrade the user module or the trips module or whatever modules you like, you need to upgrade everything. Everything is tightly coupled. If you split this into uh, microservices, the result is not going to be very good. So first, you need to break up your application in components. You need to make sure they are separated and they are isolated. Um, and then we, you can move to services. And services are... Um, like components, but the difference is that they're running a separate process. And you communicate through them, um, usually through some web medium, um, through via the network. And when they are um, nicely separated and each head has its own business domain, you can easily move them into different services. And basically, this is the um, definition that I like the most of a microservice architecture this loosely coupled service-oriented architecture uh, with bounded context. Um, and loosely coupled means that you can deploy one service without affecting the, the rest. You can restart it, you can um, deploy it, you can change it, evolve it. And at, at the same time, you have a bounded context. Not only you, you can deploy it, but it doesn't know that much about the, microser the microservices that it communicates to. They have really great interface between them that isolating the uh, business logic that they can do, and uh, they're responsible for the business domain that they're using. Um, some examples for um, microservices that we have in Uber. We have a microservice for users. It's encapsulating all the business logics about users. We have the same for trips, for payments. Um, each of them have, uh, has their own storage. Um, they keep the, they keep everything about the domain, and this is how microservices should be organized. Each microservice should be responsible for one thing. But when you split a microservice architecture in uh, a lot of services, maybe you do it because you need uh, to grow a lot or you need to have uh, av better availability. This means that you're going to have a lot of machines on which your microservice architecture is running, and. Basically, you need to do the, the 
deployment of those microservices. When you have a lot of machines, you need to have an easy way to deploy them. You need to have an easy way for them to communicate with each other. And you also you need to have a good way to do monitoring because in a big architecture, when there are a lot of services, everything can go wrong and you need to know when something goes wrong so you can fix it. And first we're going to start with the deployment. And here the, wor the world agrees that in order to do good deployment of microservice architecture or everything these days, you need to use containers. How many of you have used containers or know what containers are? Okay, most of you. So as you know, in Linux or in any Unix system, you have this tree of processes. And what does a, con a container mean? So you just pick one process and you do a couple of things. First, you uh, execute a C group on it. With the C group, you can uh, control the resource usage of this process. You can define how many CPU it can use, how many memory, and a lot of different things. And after that, you apply an, a name, namespace around it. And what the namespace does is that it uh, uh, controls what the process C outside of it. And you can control what process ID is the process C, uh, what users, what, what uh, mount places. And when you encapsulate a process, you, uh, you control the, the resources that it can use, like CPU and memory. And then you isolate it in a way that it can't view everything outside of its scope. So if you have a container, the PID of the container will be one. And this is just because of the namespace that, that you have defined. Um, it's encapsulating what it can view outside. This is what the container is. But it's actually, actually a lot more complicated. Because after you isolate the process, you want to give it a file system that you need to change the, the mount place of this file system. So the root directory of um, the container should not be the root directory of the, of the Linux machine. Um, you need to have a file system. You need to control networking and everything. And that, that's why um, Docular became re really popular, because it handles all this logic for you. It uh, constructs the container, do, do, it's doing the C groups, the namespaces, the network isolation, the, the read-only file system. So you can just put your application inside the container, which as we saw is just to start the application and then isolate it in a couple of ways to connect it to a file system, and that's it. You get a, you get a container. Uh, this is how they work. And with uh, Docker, you can, you can get one container, but how do you manage to deploy it on a thousand machines or uh, many machines? And uh, there is one tool that's called Docker Swarm, Swarm and uh, it's using the, the standard Docker uh, API to control uh, how it's going to deploy machines, where it's going to deploy them, uh, when to start them, to stop them. It's basically an orchestration layer for uh, Docker inf infrastructure. And it's an open source project, you can check it out. And Docker is not the only types of containers that we have. We also have another um, world, let's say, and it's called Kubernetes. With it, um, we, we again make, uh, get containers, but um, they're not Docker, they're, they're just uh, using the same principle. And basically we have containers that are running inside pods. And one pod is actually a group of containers. These pods are put on nodes, and this is how you uh, or orchestrate your stuff, your architecture. You define pods, and you can also apply labels to, to the pods. For example, if um, you have a uh, microservice that's responsible for the users, you're going to have uh, maybe one container inside each pod that is part of this uh, service that's handling, for example, users. And yeah, it's another word, is the containers, but different type of containers. And um, on the other hand, we have uh, other orchestration that you can do on a higher level. And a good tool f for deploying uh, here is me Mesos. It's, ex it's actually a tool that you're using at Uber, and it's great because it gives you a lot of flexibility. With Mesos, you have master and uh, slaves, um, okay, standby masters, 
who can become mas masters if the primary master fail. It's very uh, reliable. You have Mesos agents running on each um, host that, that you need to deploy your services on. And uh, basically what you get is that you can deploy tasks. Uh, it doesn't matter. One, one type of task can be a container. Another type of task can be something else. And in, me in Mesos, you, you can have a very uh, powerful way to schedule them. And you have a framework that's basically res responsible for uh, scheduling to res resources. It knows what resources are available in the systems. And based on some predefined rules, it can pick the best strategy to deploy your application in the uh, current situation. And yeah, Mesos is what we actually decided to use at Uber. And the reason for that is that it gives you the flexibility you can have uh, on, on the same cluster. You can have stateful applications like Cassandra. Um, and at the, the same time, you can have um, a Hadoop job running. And this is really powerful because we can use the same cluster, use its resources in the mo most optimal way. And Mesos is uh, dealing with all the scheduling of the tasks and their execution. Um, after we deploy our application on a lot of services, they need to communicate with each other. And over here, you see the evolution of the protocols that um, we have used um, in, in, in the history of computing. Um, right now, most of the services used REST and Thrift. Um, yeah, we went went from RPC to some strange stuff like Corba, then from remote method execution to XML RPC, and then through SOAP, which was really um, it had it had a lot of uh, complexity in, inside it. Then we moved to something like REST, and then nowadays. Um, it's like uh, we, we get some more uh, exci exciting stuff, like Thrift. Um, when you do REST, you're, you're usually doing uh, HTTP. And inside a modern data center, you don't need all the overhead of an HTTP. You need to send some data. You need to get a response. And uh, you don't need all the headers or the, uh, all, all the responses. You just want to send data. And Thrift is g very good in doing this. It's uh, Binary serialization protocol, it has a schema, so you know uh, you have a contract of the things that, that you're uh, going to communicate to, throughout your services. And it's very optimal because it's not plain text like HTTP, um, it's more optimal. And um, yeah, more, it is, it's better to use it if you want to have a good bandwidth of the communication and you have a big. Um, system with a lot of communication going on. Because communication was one of the most important stuff with in a microservice architecture. Um, yeah, because for example in Uber when you complete a trip and you we want to process a, process the trip, you need to call the user service to get the to, to get the rider, the driver information, then you need to call to the payment system to get if the trip is paid, then you need to call another service to get a map maybe to, to display it on, on a receipt, then you need uh, to call a lot of services, and th this needs this needs to be very optimal and very is easy to do. And um, another thing that Thrift help you in, with this communication is that when you have a strictly defined API, it's very obvious what the other microservice can do. If you had a microservice for trips, and in, inside the trip definition, you know what you need to send as a request, what fields there need to be. In, in an object that you're going to set as a request for a trip. And you need you, you know what their um, types are of each field. You know what you're going to do, uh, what you're going to receive a response. And you know all the operations that you can execute on this microservice. So in this, this way, Drift really helps with efficiency at, and with um, dis discoverability and obviousness of um, the communication that's happening. And the discovery is another very important topic because when you have a lot of services, they are deployed on many, many machines. You have an efficient way to communicate between the machines. Now, how um, the user service is going to know about the trip service or the other way around? How they are going to discover each other? How, how it's going to know where to send the, the uh, trip requests so 
to get a response. Um, you need to do it. You, you want to do it in a um, very aut automatic way. When you add new resources, you want you want them to be automatically discoverable. When you remove resources, you want them to be removed from the uh, communication. And yeah, you want basically availability. When you add your new resources, they should join the the architecture immediately. When they leave, they should be discarded. And a good example for this is um, uh, etcd. It's actually just a key value store that a lot of people use for service discovery. And it's a very, very simple way. So basically, uh, what etcd is, is it's a consistent distributed key value store. What does it mean that it's consistent? It means that uh, no matter the fact that it can run on many, many machines, if I r write something in one of the machines and then I read it from another machine, I'm going to receive the same value. This means consistent. Every time when I write, when I read, I get the most recent thing that's been written in etcd. And um, how is the discovery working? So you have a cron job, for example, on each host, and periodically it's sending re requests to etcd and saying, hey, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm responsible for users. And uh, this is happening per periodically, and each key inside the it, 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 this storage has expiration time. So basically, you need to refresh it, otherwise, it will expire. And if a host dies, it's not going to refresh its value that it's there, and um, the, the value is going to expire. And when you ask it, CD, give me all the instances for the user service, it's not going to receive the one that's expired. And um, this is very, very simple, but on the other hand, you, you can have something more flexible. A good example here is a tool, tool that we've open sourced uh, and developed in Uber, and it's called Hyperban. Basically, the way it's handled um, discoverability is a little bit different. We are using a gossip membership protocol, which means that um, when a new host join, joins a cluster, when a, new, when a new instance of a service join, joins the cluster, it starts, starts to gossip around randomly to, his, uh, to, to its neighbors that uh, he's there. And when the, when they're, when, uh, the neighbors discover, receive the message, they po populate it in their own message that, uh, with, with all the hosts that participate in this service, and um, they send this information randomly, again, like a gossip to other hosts, this is how the hosts discover each other. Just by gossiping, um, there is a new computer joining, and yeah, he's saying, hi, I'm here. Then all, the, all, the, all his neighbors uh, sees that the computer is there, starts to gossip around, hey, there's, there's a new guy over here. He's responsible for doing this. And this is how everybody learn. Um, when, you, when a server... Um, dies and is no longer reachable, when you send a request to it and it uh, doesn't respond, to, we can remove it from our table with uh, the, the instances of this service, and then we can start gossiping around, hey, this guy is no longer around, you can remove him. And this is on a high level. On a low le level, there are a lot of implementation details, but basically this is what Hyperbound does. One of, one of the thi things that it does is that it provides you discoverability. The services can discover each other um, very efficiently. Uh, after they know about each other, another problem that we need to solve is about load balancing. So it, it's uh, good that we know, for example, that the user service has five, 50 instances, so 500 or 5,000. So right, uh, what you want to do is to distribute the load equally between all those 500 instances or 50. Uh, it doesn't matter. And one approach that it's uh, used in, uh, for example, Kubernetes is the following. You have a service that's just a definition. And it's um, a definition. When a service receives a request, it uh, routes it through um, the pods that have some labels. As I told you earlier, uh, pods can have labels, and you, you can uh, have a label on your pod, for example, that's saying this is a user service, it's a production instance, and blah, 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 as many labels as you can. 
you, you can have another pod that's saying this is a user service, it's a test instance, user service, staging instance. And what the service is going to do is going to find all the pods that, for example, are tagged with tag user production. When it receives a, a request, it's going to, um, on a round robin princ principle, choose where to send the request, and it's going to do actually do the load balancing. And again, um, we, we can have a different approach, not to have a, a, a centralized place that load balances the request through the, through the instances of each service, but actually to leave this on the client, client to decide how to load balance the request. And we do this in another project that we have, it's called RingPub, and basically what it has is it has this ring, it's called consistent hash ring. Um, these are all the members uh, of a service, and they are responsible for a certain uh, key key space of uh, object. Each, for, for example, if you have a um, service that is handling users, um, and each user ha has a key, we do a hashing function that through transforming a key to a uh, number from zero to one, and this is how we find who is the, m the owner of this resource. And if they're very random, randomly, the hash function is, uh, has a good di distribution, um, it's, it's random, also the, the, the UIDs are random, um, this is going to give us a very good load balance between the nodes. And basically, if, if you want to execute something with the user, with, with some of the users, to fetch it, for example, we know what the, it, the identifier of this user is, we pass it to the hash function, we receive a number from one to zero, then we check on the ring where the, this number fits, and then we get um, with the node that is closer. Okay, so this object belongs, belongs to host uh, with attack A, for example and you know when, where, when to send the request to get a response. And when you add uh, new hosts to the, to the cluster, they're just added to the ring, and there's a very little balancing of keys that, that, that you need to do. When uh, some host dies, it's again the, the entering and removing of hosts from a cluster it is done through uh, this gossip uh, protocol that we, uh, this, that we that I showed you earlier. And with the gossip protocol, um, the cluster is uh, adding and removing hosts in a decentralized way. They are arranged in this ring. You calculate the hash of each object and you know who, uh, which host to call to find it, to execute an operation on it. And after we have all, all the communication, the services are, um, discoverable, they can communicate efficiently, they can load balance requests between each other. Another very, very important aspect that we need to look at our microservice architecture is circuit breaking. Uh, circuit breaking is this protection mechanism that fires when your uh, service performance is uh, degradating. And what, what it can do, it can, for example, if um, your communication layer sees that your service has increased response times, this means that your service is under load, it's uh, having some hard time, so it's response slower. It can decide to cut some of the traffic, to say, okay, I'm, uh, I want this service to recover, I'm going to cut 30% of the traffic on the communication layer, I'm not going to uh, return any response. And this circuit breaking, it gives you, your service, a chance to recover. It's going to receive, receive less traffic, maybe it's going to finish everything that it's doing on the background, it's gonna catch up. And sometimes the circuit breaking is going to be disabled gradually and then com completely switched off. And you can have circuit breaking for read, read operations, where for example, instead of uh, reading the most uh, recent value, you can start reading from a cache that the circuit breaker has. Or if you are doing write operations and circuit breaker, breaker fires, um, this means that it can um, record the request in a queue, and then when your service recovers, you can execute them. So it's very, very um, important topic to, to consider in a modern microservice architecture to have circuit breaking. And when the services can communicate, you can deploy them. It's very, very important to monitor how they're working, how they're performing, um, what, what's their health. 
and you can measure a lot of, a lot of things for a service you can measure the success rate you can measure the error rate you can measure what are the response times of your of the services that you're calling of your upstream services of your downstream services and you can react in each situation you can check how many requests are, uh, there are uh, coming to your service how many of them are successful how many are not you can measure the queue size and um, it's very important also to monitor the usages of the resources that you have because when you have containers it's very very easy to hide memory leaks because your container is isolated it has a certain amount of memory um, when it consumes all the memory it's going to be restarted for example from your orchestration layer and you're, you're going to receive an error for it's good to receive an error for this just to know that you have a memory leak because it's important to fix it but if you don't have monitor monitoring you have containers most probably you're never gonna know and also another uh, very important monitoring that we learned the hard way is that you need to you need to measure this this space available uh, especially for the database machines very important and something that we learned in a hard way is that just measuring the health of your service is not enough. Um, you need, may maybe it's, it's not going to have any exceptions, it's not going to have any errors, it's not going, the responses rates will be good, the, the, um, the resource usage will be wonderful, and again, you can, um, it, it can be working wrong. It can return wrong requests, and it cannot, maybe it's not, it's operating properly because it's not doing what it's intended to do. So it's very, very important also to have business metrics monitoring in, in your system. Uh, for example, in Uber, my team is working on um, one service that is issuing invoices to, ev to everybody that uses Uber. And um, it, it may be working wonderful, but maybe for one country and one, one city, we may stop issuing invoices because of some bug in our code and we need to have this business level monitoring that said, okay, in this city, the number of successfully issued invoices drop from uh, many thousands to zero, for example. You need to have uh, um, monitoring on this. And a good thing uh, for business metric monitoring, good tool, is a tool called Prometheus. You can, you can check it out. I don't know why I didn't put a link, but yeah, it's called Prometheus in, in GitHub. And uh, the monitoring can be something really, really hard to do. For example, this is the architecture that we have in Uber. Each service uh, is pushing it uh, log messages to a Kafka stream. Then we have one Hadoop cluster that is consuming the messages from the Kafka, executing some logic on them, and then storing them into something called ELK, which is abbreviation for Elasticsearch, Log Stash, and Kibana. And Elastic, what Elasticsearch does is that it um, allows you to search through your logs. For example, I want to see all the errors that happened in this period of time for uh, this th this type of messages that has this word, for example, in sign. For example, error or warning or some class name. Um, Logstash is a tool that allows you to um, uh, actually manipulate your logs in a way so that they can be readable in the elastic search ba basically log stash is the etf job that you're running on your messages so they can be indexed by elastic search then kibana is this really nice ui when you can do dashboards and you can do um, fancy queries and it's really easy to use but it doesn't mean to be that complicated for example you can decide to go with something simpler and use the standard called stats d it's the standard that pretty much everyone adopts these days. And um, it's a way to push uh, st statistics in a very uh, optimal way. And what you can do with it, you can count stuff. For example, you can say increment the value with uh, this key. For example, um, number of received requests. Increment In each request, you increment it. When the response is correct, you increment, for example, you're saying increment the number of successful responses. If there is an error, you say increment the number of errors of this type or that type of errors or try errors or um, unhandled exceptions. And you can also decrease values. For example, when you receive a request, you push it into a queue, you can say, okay, increase the, no the number of elements in this queue. 
then when the job is finished, you can say, okay, decrease it. That's how you, you can monitor something. You can also measure time. You, you can say, okay, this function uh, executed for the, this time. And then uh, what it what StatsD allows you to do is to say what's the average time it took this function to execute, what was the average time yesterday, and um, uh, very when when you measure performance, it's not about the average time or the the there are a lot of metrics that you need to consider. For example, um, one very important metric is P95. It's very important to know what what is the maximum amount of time that it took 95% uh, of your request to execute in. Um, because th there's going to be some outliers, and you're saying, okay, in this case, 5% outliers, there may be spikes there, um, I don't care, but for 95%, this is how you usually measure your res response time, uh, time, all the times that you have in your system. It's either P95, which is for 95% of the traffic, what was the average time, or P99, for 99% of the traffic, what, what was the average uh, speed, what was the average time that it happened. And there is a, a server from Etsy, it's called StasD, it's a Node.js server that uh, is just ag can aggre aggregate uh, st statistics from uh, clients. And one client that I have uh, put over here on the slide is a client that we have op open source at Uber. It's called Links, and it allows you to easily uh, publish stats the um, monitoring uh, information. And actually, monitoring is not enough. If you just have some statistics that are just producing some output on in your Kibana, some fancy graphics, this is not enough. You actually need to have processes uh, so you can react proactively on the things that you see on your dashboards. And um, for, for example, you may w want to have alerting. When some things go wrong, you need to receive a notification. Um, when, when you receive a notification, another important thing that you need to have is a run book, uh, some document that explains what you need to do. If you see this type of error, you need to do this. If you, need, if you see this type of error, you need to do this. Um, and after you have fixed the error, you need to be uh, proactive in finding a way for this error not to happen again. So it's very important to do post-mortems. Then post-mortems are, are these documents where you describe what was the root cause, uh, what was the effect, how can, what can you do, what particular action items you need to take, what tasks you need to implement, what code you need to write. So this never, never happens again. It's, the process is actually the most important part in the monitoring. You need to have a process set up in your organization that's looking at what's happening and reacting or being proactive about it. And as you, as you can see, uh, the microservices are this very, can be this very complex ar architecture. Um, there is a complex solutions for deploying them, complex solutions for communication, for monitoring, for all aspects of the microservices. And it's very important not to fall in the trap into going and try to implement it if you don't need all of this. Um, don't have the fear of missing out the hype. It, it, it's not cool to have uh, microservices just for sake of having microservices. When you need them, you're gonna know. It's better to have one, um, one application. You can lock uh, the information inside it easier. You can trace how requests are going very, very easy. You can deploy it easily, you can upgrade it easily, just one thing. And yeah, jo don't do microservices just in the sake of doing microservices, because if you have a monolith, you have one monster that's doing scary stuff and you need to worry about, but if you have microservices, you had a lot of monsters, each doing different scary stuff, and you, you need to deal with each one of those. So yeah. Thank you very much. Let's have some questions. Вопроси. Hi, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I have a question because you said uh, you are using Thrift as in 
as a means of internal communication. What about outside world? Do you use again Drift or, and have you looked into gRPC and Protobuf? Uh, can you repeat your question because I couldn't hear. It's okay. really, uh, the mic is really not noisy. Okay, so again, it's really quiet. Um, you said you're using Thrift as a means of internal communication. What about outside world? And have you looked into gRPC and Protobuf? Uh, yeah, we have ev evaluated Protobuf. And uh, what, what was the other project that you mentioned? The gRPC G and Protobuf? G GRPC. Yeah, we, we, evalu we evaluated Protobuf, but what we really needed is a communication uh, serialization protocol. Actually, the only thing that we're using uh, from Thrift is the serialization protocol. Um, and then we're, we're pushing this on top of a, uh, another project that we have. It's called T-Channel. It's a, a communication protocol, network protocol um, that's very efficient in a modern data center. Doesn't rely on TCP because in a modern data center, most of the time you're not going to have packet loss. You're not going to have um, the things that uh, TCP is dealing with. So it's maybe you can have something between TCP and UDP. This is what T-Channel is. And then on top of T-Channel, we wanted to have a a very optimal uh, serialization mechanism to, s to serialize objects in a binary way, way so we can transform it efficiently. And yeah, lose, use as, as little resources as we can. It's a simple question, probably. Those systems tend to be eventual consistent, right? Yeah, yeah. So what are the problems that you're facing dealing with the eventual consistency? Yeah, so for example, in one of the, in one, as I mentioned, one of the projects that my team is working on is uh, invoices. And in invoices, you need to have consequential numbering of invoices. And uh, yeah, they, they need to be consequential. There should be no gaps. They should be ordered um, in in the way of the, of the events that happened, and you can have uh, multiple events that compete for the same invoice number. So it's really important to have strong consistency. And we evaluated different approaches how we can achieve this in a this uh, in a in a distributed distributed way. But in our case, one, what we actually need is it. What we need is. Um, all the ACID properties of a database. Um, we need uh, autonomy, consistency, we need durability that a uh, few of the non-SQL storage services provide. So what we decided is that we're going to keep just the consistent part of the whole operation inside the relational database uh, to have it consistent so we have, can have transactions, integrity and everything to take all the advantages of a relational database then put the massive data that is connected to these events in a Cassandra, which can scale horizontally uh, easily. And um, yeah, this is the approach that we decided, trade-off that we did. But yeah, this was really, uh, when you do such an application, you, as you know, you can't have both uh, consistency and uh, availability at the same time, which means that you can't have um, distributed architecture that at the same time you can always re write something in that then read the most recent value and at the same time receiving responses each time. Um, most of the Uber is not worried, don't have that much consistency constraint. Um, they can have eventual consistency, but in money, in our team, we need to have uh, cons consistency, very strong, and it's really hard to achieve it in a distributed scalable system. But it's fun. How small is small? How would you define uh, when a service should be microservice? How how do we define if a service what service should be? A, how small? How service do you identify whenever uh, there is a possibility to create a microservice out of some functionality? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have uh, some process defined or some strict uh, um, rules when a service should become when uh, something should be split into microservices. It just happens naturally. And when you um, split the service in, 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 split something in microservices, 
um, the, the code is not really the problem because uh, there is one law that says that the way that you structure your application as architecture is going to reflect the way that your organization is structured um, in teams or in uh, organizationally how, how it's structured. So when you want, when you have a service and you want to split it in microservices, you need to think about, okay, can I split the people in this team in, in separate teams? Can they do separate work? Will they, they benefit from this thing? And basically, yeah, it's more case by case thing. It's not, we don't have some rules when something should be split. And yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure what is the difference between a service and a microservice. I don't think there is, but yeah, when, when you need to, to split one service in two services, you just know it, that the time is right. Maybe the, the two teams uh, compete with each other. They need different things. Then you said, okay, it's not efficient. Uh, you have very different business objectives. This code started to look at two different pieces of stuff. So let's let's play it up. This is how it usually happens. Okay, is it needed a regular developer to be aware of uh, all the? It's me here. Okay, uh, is it <laughs> needed that a regular developer in your company should be aware of all this architecture, or one can just uh, make some changes in the microservice and? Uh, the other part of the team is uh, about the deploying process and everything. There is a there is pretty good abstraction, maybe, that you can just communicate with the other services uh, without knowing the whole process of the of the architecture. Yeah. So um, you need to know the building blocks of the architecture. So, for example, when I'm writing my service, I need to be able to deploy it in my test environment. So I need to know how the deployment stuff is working. Um, when I when I'm writing some code, I want to test it, so I want to do some test requests to, to the service. Then I need to know how it's communicating. Um, then, when when I when the service is running in production, I really need to know um, how the monitoring is working because I need to know what delays are expected, why something might might be missing, where can I find it? Is it not replicated to the place? that I'm looking at right now. Um, so in, either, in order to do your job day to day, you need to know how applications are deployed, how they communicate, how um, it is monitored. But you may, it's enough to know this on a high enough, high enough level for you to uh, do your job. For example, you may not know how exactly the algorithm was written that is going to keep uh, the membership uh, protocol of, of a service. But it's enough to know that there is such such a thing, and there are, there are some teams that working on the tools that we're using. So they're working on the on the deployment layer. When I get just one fancy UI, I log in. I say, "Okay, oh, I want to deploy this commit to these boxes. Deploy." And it's going to deploy. It's going to watch for errors. If there is an error, it's going to revert back. If not, it's going to deploy it more. And um, there are teams that are doing all these uh, tools and infrastructure work, and there are uh, teams that are using this infrastructure and building the services to use the business needs of the to service the business needs of the organization. A round of applause for Nikolai. <laughs> <laughs>